Greetings to all Islam brethren around the world. Today will be the first presentation of the weekend program of the General Conference Administration. For this reason, I thank God for giving me this privilege to study with you a very special subject, caring for each other. As we all know that God's government is founded upon love, it is His greatest desire to care and supply all the needs of all the animate and inanimate creatures of the fallen and unfallen worlds, as He is so careful that every one of them will receive all the blessings from Him every day. In order to publish God's character to this planet Earth, He established a church with one great sublime purpose. The church was established in order to reflect the character of God and preach His good news to all nations, tribes, languages, and people. And when her mission is completed, she will be transformed and translated to the eternal kingdom of Christ. We all know that every now and then people are coming to our church through baptism. But unfortunately, many of them are exiting in the back door of our churches. And it is amazing to know that if those people who were apostatized will be prevented, how many members our church would have if we retain all these people that were apostatized. You know, it is necessary that we should act in order to avoid this problem. It has been said that prevention is better than cure. When we say or when we speak about prevention of apostasy, we think that we should give proper instructions to the people in the doctrines before baptism. That is right. That is logical. We need to prepare properly the souls before baptism. But actually, apostasy is caused by several reasons. Number one, unconsecrated leadership. Number two, inappropriate sermons. Number three, lack of preparation before baptism. And number four, lack of consecration of the person concerned. And number five, deviated focus on heavenly things. And number six, some spiritual diseases affecting the church membership. However, apostasy is also a social problem. Only few of the people who left the church stopped to believe our doctrinal teachings. And while majority left because they had problems with human relations. One of them said, in the church, love is lacking. Another one said, nobody was concerned about me when I had problems. Another one said, Father, I felt lonely since I came to the Reformed Church. I lost many friends, and now I am alone. One report of an apostatized member should be taken seriously by the leaders of our churches. He said, in the church, there are groups of close friends that don't give attention to the newcomers. In the first week when I was baptized, during the midweek prayer, I was very happy and I was the first one to arrive in the church. And during Sabbath, in that first Sabbath after my baptism, in the Sabbath morning, I went early to the church. 
And after divine service, all friends began to group together. And none of these groups had taken care of me as a newly baptized member. In this case, we failed our sublime duties, my beloved brothers and sisters. This is the reason why many people will exit in the back door of our churches. In our high calling, page 370, paragraph 4, there is too much coldness and indifference, too much of the I don't care spirit exercised among the professed followers of Christ. All should feel, care for one another, jealously guarding each other's interests. We can see here that if we want that our churches will be a living, a successful, and a lively church, we need to be a visitor's friendly church. Our people must be lively, must be loving, must be very good in attending visitors, especially those persons who are just duly baptized into the church. And you see here in the Spirit of Prophecy that all should feel a care for one another, jealously guarding its other's interest. We should shun away this I don't care spirit. We should shun away this coldness, this indifference. Too much indifference inside the church will cause exiting of members in our church. In the book of John 13, 34, Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. In verse 35, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one another. So this is the mark of a true Christian gentleman. If we love one another, if people will see that all members in the church are caring for one another and loving one another, supporting one another, then people in the world will see that this is the true church and that we are the disciples of Christ. In the book of Acts of the Apostles 547, at the time when these words were spoken, the disciples could not understand them, but after they had witnessed the suffering of Christ, after his crucifixion and resurrection and ascension to heaven, and after the Holy Spirit had rested on them at Pentecost, they had a clearer conception of the love of God and of the nature of the love which they must have for one another. Then John could say to his fellow disciples, Hereby perceive we love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Here we can see that loving one another is not just helping one another. It is not just caring one another. The deepest meaning of loving one another was demonstrated by Christ in the cross of Calvary when he laid down his life for us. Then we ought also to lay down our lives for our brethren. This is the deepest and the truest meaning of loving one another. The question is, who has the prime duty to take care for the flock of God? We all know that the pastors and ministers has the prime duty to care for the flock. In Evangelism 351, paragraph 2, after individuals had been converted to the truth, they need to be looked after. The zeal of many ministers seems to fail as soon as a measure of success attends their efforts. 
They do not realize that these newly converted ones need nursing, watchful attention, help, and encouragement. And it is really sad to know that many uh, brethren who were just baptized, they were complaining. Before baptism, when they were still interested in the church, they received so much encouragement from the minister, they received so much calling, so much texting, so much messages, and after baptism, what happened? Nobody take care for them, nobody call for them, nobody takes them. Spirit of Prophecy says that the work of saving souls will not be finished after or just during baptism. There is still a lot of works to do after baptism. They need nursing, watchful attention, help, and encouragement so that these babies in faith, they will grow mature and grow spiritually in the knowledge and in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Another thing that the ministers and Bible workers should think about is feeding the flock. Evangelism 346, paragraph 3. My brethren, in the gospel ministry, let us feed the flock of God. Let us bring encouragement and cheerfulness to every heart. We should take note that the pulpit is the place wherein we should feed the flock. It is not designed to hammer, to attack. It is not designed to bombard people in their sins, but in their house, in their respective houses. All exhortations, all rebukings should be done. And that's why many ministers and Bible workers should think it about and they should prepare new sermons every Sabbath or every week so that they can feed the flock with the right food, the right food in the due season. And the people will be fed and will be nutrified and they will receive the spiritual nutrient from the Bible workers and the ministers. Another thing that the minister should be uh, careful and should be thinking and should do it as part of their work during the week is visitation to every family. Evangelism 346 paragraph 5, as the shepherd of the flock, he, the minister, should care for the sheep and the lambs searching out the lost and straying and bringing them back to the fold. He should visit every family, not merely as a guest to enjoy their hospitality, but to inquire into the spiritual condition of every member of the household. And it is interesting to note that ministers should not only go and visit, sit down, relax, and listen to the tales of the brethren. But if the brethren are very busy in their work, especially in the farm or some another duties or some other activities, Bible workers and ministers should go with them and join in their work. And if during the time, during their, their working together, then a minister can easily interject about the spiritual condition of the family. This is the best time how to befriend members of the church. So, another thing that the ministers and the Bible workers should take note is to come close to the hearts. Manuscript 42, 1898. Come close to your brethren. Seek for them, help them, come close to their hearts as one tasked 
by the feelings of their infirmities. The members of this family should be given some labor to perform for the good of souls. Let us take note, my beloved Bible workers and ministers, that we should be friendly to our people so that it is easy for them to approach us. We should not be aloof to them. We should not think high-minded to them that we are somebody because we are ministers. These poor, erring members of the church will be afraid to come to us. But if we open our hearts unto them, be friendly unto them, like father to their children, then these brethren who are erring, these brethren who have problems, will open quickly with their problems and share their problems to the Bible workers and ministers. One most important duties of the ministers and Bible workers is reproving and exhorting. Evangelism 347, paragraph 3. There is pastoral work to do, and this means to reprove and exhort with long suffering and doctrine. That is, he should present the word of God to show wherein there is a deficiency. Remember, when we are about to correct somebody, we should think it over these three conditions that we should follow. Number one, if we reprove somebody, it should be in the right place, not in public, not in the presence of many people, but should be in a private place. And the best place is in their home. And pray for them and to him and to her alone. Talk to him following the instructions of Matthew 18. And the second condition that we need to follow is the right spirit. When we correct somebody, we must have a right spirit, even how right we are. But if we do it with an angry spirit, we cannot convince these people, or else they will become repulsive and become rebellious. The third condition is right time. It is not good to reprimand a person to rebuke a person, to correct a person when he is hungry, when he is tired, in the middle of the night, or when the person just arrived from work. We need to be tactful in addressing uh, problems, especially in correcting our people. It should be right place, right time, and right spirit. And of course, when we are about to correct them, we should present the Word of God to show wherein there is a deficiency. The next in line of duty to care for the flock are the church elders and leaders. In the book of Acts 20, 17 to 28, we found out that the last meeting of Apostle Paul with the elders of Ephesus and how he vested them their duties to care for the church because he cannot see them again. Apostle Paul's ministry was so successful because he was ordaining elders in every local churches. And he instructed them. And let us quote, one of those verses in the book of Acts, verse 28, chapter 20. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. You see here, the elders are the overseers 
to feed the flock of God in the local churches. Apostle Peter also continued in 1 Peter 5 verses 1 to 3. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not by filthy lacquer, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords of our God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Here we can see the amonestation, the instruction of Apostle Peter to the elders. He said that as leaders of the local church, we should lead by example. We should not be forcing people to follow us. We should not be domineering. We should not be high-minded. We should not be dictator or forcing others. But we should be willing to serve our people, not receiving money for services but we need to serve them with all our hearts, not being lords of our God's heritage, but being an example to the flock. As we understand in these two uh, verses given by Apostle Paul and Apostle Peter, we can conclude that the elders are the local pastors elected by the church to take care of the flock locally. And the elder of the church has to care, especially the recently baptized members. See that they will not feel lonesome. The elder of the church has to watch that they will not have social friction with the rest of the brethren. He will help them to find new friends to replace their former friends that were lost when they follow Christ. It is also the duty of the deaconry to take care for the flock. And they have a very important task to do. Number one, they should be giving the welcome in the door or in the gate of the church. And number two, they should maintain order in the church during church services. You know, the deacon and the deaconess are the face of our church. The way how they treat the visitors who come to the church will determine whether these visitors will come back again. They should be friendly. They should be smiling. They should attend the necessities of the visitors. They should give Bible if they don't have Bible. They should give Sabbath school lessons during the Sabbath school. They should lead, lead these people to their seats and guide them where to go to find some restrooms, to find some water to drink. So this is really, really a big task of the deacon and as they will do this task it will determine the visitors will come back again and it is also a very important thing that they should remember that inside the church to maintain quietness of church services sometimes children will be running and they don't have that idea that it is wrong because they are children then the deacons and the deaconess should be very careful how to correct these little children or else they might offend their parents, especially uh, visitors who have children who come to the church. Of course, they will not let the church services to be disturbed, but they should be very tactful how to control the children inside the church, not offending the parents. So, the deacons 
are very important in caring for the flock of God. They should supply the needs of the flock, spiritual and material needs of the members. The deacons and deaconesses should visit the family that has family problems. They were the first one to respond when there are some family problems. At least they should help to reconcile misunderstanding among members following biblical procedures. And of course, they are the ones supplying the religious materials such as Sabbath school lessons, tracts, magazines, and other religious books that our people need. Also, they are the ones who will respond immediately when there are sick person in the church, if they have physical needs, especially to church, worthy poor. Another most important officer of the local church is the local missionary department director. He has the duty to move the church into action, and he should introduce into the local church members occupational therapy. It is by integrating them in evangelism activities. As you know, that human beings were not created to be inactive. Activity is a sign of life and progress. That is why when somebody gives her or his life to Jesus, we should integrate them in all our evangelism activities. Let us remember also that the feeling of being useful is a factor of happiness. Our local missionary director makes our members happy when he integrates everybody to bring other souls to Christ. And in that feeling of happiness, and the feeling of being utilized by the church will hold them and it will be a tie, it will be a bond that will bring them together in the church that they will not come out from the church. It will prevent apostasy from our churches. Evangelism 353 paragraph 4 Just as soon as a church is organized, let the minister set the members at work. They will need to be taught how to labor successfully. We need to understand that our church will be active. Our church will be a missionary church, a missionary-oriented church. And the ministers, the leaders of the church, especially the local missionary department, will move the church members into action. Of course, they should be thought first how to labor successfully. Testimonies for the Church 431 paragraph 2. The churches are withering up because they had failed to use their talents in diffusing light. It means that people are not satisfied People are not happy. People feel felt bored up, felt boring inside the church. They are just sitting down, listening the sermons, and go back home. They are useless. So it will create the feeling of and usefulness, and most likely will motivate them to go out and find another church which is very active in missionary work. So that's why the church is withering up. Is it that the membership will grow, then membership will go down, and then every year instead of increasing, membership are decreasing. And, and it is really a sad fact that our church is languishing in membership because of this reason. Our members are not thought how to use their talents in diffusing lights. 
Testimony Volume 6, 431. The people have had too much sermonizing, but have they been taught how to labor for those for whom Christ died? Has a line of labor been devised and placed before them in such a way that each has seen the necessity of taking part in the work? We are thinking that our duty as a minister is finished when we give sermons in the pulpit. That is wrong. Our work has just begun in the pulpit, but there must be practical demonstration to our members how to do missionary work. So much sermons, so much preaching, so much lecturing, but we are not teaching our people how to become active missionaries. This is the reason why many of our brethren are exiting from our church. What about the local church members? Do they have important role in caring for other members, especially the newcomers? Evangelism 351, paragraph 1. Those who have newly come to the faith should be patiently and tenderly dealt with. And it is the duty of the older members of the church to devise ways and means to provide help and sympathy and instruction for those who have conscientiously withdrawn from other churches for the truth's sake. What shall we do as church members? It is not wise that after church services we'll group together and find our friends and another group there and another group there and another group there. But what about these newcomers in the church? No one will take care for them. And it is really very amazing if every one of us will be looking for some newcomers will be looking some visitors and sit beside them and talk with them and eat together with them and during the meal time and the lunch time have time with them and talk to them so that they will be happy they will feel at home in our church evangelism 351 paragraph 3 no wonder that some become discouraged linger by the way and are left for wolves to devour. There should be more fathers and mothers to take care for these babies in the truth to their hearts and to encourage them and pray for them that their faith be not be confused. So this is really an important work for the local church members. They should be fathers and they should be mothers to take care for the babies in the truth to their hearts. They should see to it that these newcomers are feeling at home in the church and see to it that they have some friends inside the church. My Life Today 245 paragraph 2 It is a special sense Christ has laid upon his church the duty of caring for the needy among its own members. He suffers his poor to be in the borders of every church. They are always to be among us, and he places upon the members of the church a personal responsibility to care for them. As the members of a true family care for one another, ministering to the sick, supporting the weak, teaching the ignorant, training the inexperienced, so is the household of faith to take care for its needy and helpless ones. It was amazing to remember last March, April, May, and June here in our country that was ultimately the government closed all the borders of the airport of the seaports, of all transportations that are traveling 
and nobody can go to work. And who was really affected? Those daily wages earners. They cannot find some money to support their daily needs. And so many of our brethren belong to that category. So looking to the situation, our church people were feeling the needs of our brethren. So quickly they raised some funds and gathered some foodstuffs and quickly sent to our brethren during this pandemic season of COVID-19. Then they received some help, they received some financial support, and they were very happy to feel that their uh, brethren who are financially well off, that they share their bounties to them. And just recently, we also during this year, we suffered setbacks of three devastating typhoons and some earthquake that attacked our brethren in the southern part of the country. Many of our brethren's houses were destroyed. And when the typhoon came, the farms and their plantations also were destroyed. And it was amazing that our people also in our, in our church quickly raised up some funds and some foodstuffs and they used some vehicles to gather them and went to the brethren who were affected and visited their homes and houses and distributed the relief for those needy brethren. And it is amazing. And they felt the love of our fellow brethren. As you see here, God suffers that our brethren who belongs to this poor category are always there in the borders of every church. That's why as members of the true family of God, we need to minister the sick, support the weak, teaching the ignorant, training the inexperienced, so that the true Christian gentleness and Christian character will be stamped in every member of the church. My life today, 245, paragraph 5, a true Christian is the poor man's friend. He deals with his perplexed and unfortunate brother as one who deal with a delicate, tender, sensitive plant. God wants his workers to move among the sick and suffering as members of his love and mercy. He is looking upon us to see how we are treating one another, whether we are Christ-like in our dealing with all high or low, rich or poor, free or bond. It was amazing just some few months ago here in our country, there was a sister who has brain tumor and she was really, really very poor. And she cannot even afford to buy some medicine, but she needs operation. So one of the biggest local church here in our country raised up some funds and one brother who is also uh, financially stable donated some money also to help. And the sister was brought to the hospital and had that operation. But unluckily, the sister did not survive. And she died some few weeks ago. But you know, who paid the hospitalization bill? It was the church. It was the brethren who gathered some funds to help this poor sister. And it is really amazing to feel that our people are helping one another. Another thing that we should remember, especially for the local church brethren, is how to take care for the erring brother or erring sister. 
Galatians 6 verse 1 it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. We understand here correctly that if somebody will be overtaken in a fault, we need to restore them. Our work is the work of reconciliation. Our work is a work of helping to restore a brother or a sister who fall down in a fault and who committed mistakes. Remember also that sometimes we may commit mistakes also. We need to deal with them in the spirit of meekness and in the spirit of Christian gentleness. In Heavenly Places 289 paragraph 4, you will always have been erring ones among you. And here is where you can show a Christian character. Do not push them away from you. But if you have light, seek to let it shine upon them. And in this way, you can help them toward heaven. Let us remember that correcting others is the work of the church. We cannot suffer sin inside the church or else the whole church will be affected by that sin. But in doing it, calling the sin in its right name, we should also be very careful. We should not be pushing them to the deep abyss or to the deep gulf of disappointment. Be a good Christian gentleman. Help them to raise up, to stand up, to walk again in the newness of life. And let us remember the members of the church may commit errors and often make mistakes, but they are to be dealt with kindly, tenderly, as Christ has dealt with us. So instead of gossiping and uh, reporting the sin of our brothers and sisters to others, remember gossipers and news carriers are the terrible curse of the neighborhoods and churches. Two-thirds of all the church trials arise from this source. So instead of gossiping to others, why not come to them with a true Christian gentleness and endeavor and struggle to restore them back to the feet of Christ. Another thing that the church should take so much consideration is caring for the youth. Remember the youth are the hope of the future and the present hope of the church. Without the youth of today, there will be no old folks in, in tomorrow. In other words, only old folks, old folks remain in the church and when they will die, nobody will remain in the church because we have no young people. So that's why we must be very careful in dealing with our young people. When the Lord was uh, having time with Peter, when Peter was uh, reconverted, the Lord Jesus Christ questioned Peter three times. And for the first time, when Peter answered that, Yes, Lord, I love you, according to John 25, 15, when Jesus said, Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me more than this? Peter answered, Ye, Lord, thou knowest that I love you. 
Hearing this, he said unto him, Feed my lambs. Why the lambs was the first one introduced by Jesus. And after the second and the third question, Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Why the lamb should be taken care for first? Dear Conference Bulletin, March 20, 1891, paragraph 16. If this church becomes a living, active church, its members will have a tender care for the youth among them. They will be looking after those whose hands are hanging down, those whose feet have gone astray from the true safe path. Remember, some young people are very aggressive. They are very impulsive. They are prone to commit mistakes. But we should take care of them tenderly. I remember one deacon, when he was guarding there in the door of the church one day, the son of the minister who came to the church late was shocked when the deacon assaulted him in the door of the church. Oh, the deacon said, son of the minister, you came late. What bad things are you doing? You are not doing good examples to the young people inside the church. I will tell your dad about this. Better you should change. Wow, this young man was so upset. And because of this attitude of the deacon, he said to the deacon, from now on, I will never ever come back to this church. And that was true. Even until now, this young man become adult. His father, who was a minister, has hard time to convince him to go back to the church. And even until now, this brother will not come to the church because of the offenses that was made by this poor deacon. Brethren, it says here in Councils for the Church 58, paragraph 3, God requires his church to nurse those who are young in faith and experience to go to them not for the purpose of gossiping with them but to pray to speak unto them words that are like apples of gold in pictures of silver instead of censuring them instead of forcing them to follow the lord why not encourage them show a right spirit show a good example to these young people involve the young people in missionary work give them some activities in the church so that these young people will feel utilized in the church get them moving and use them in any special activities in the church and these young people will love the church and they will grow in the in the love of jesus and in the grace of Jesus. Sometimes there are young people who come to the church alone. Their parents, their siblings are not interested in the church. They are alone in the church. Who will be their foster parents? Who will guide them inside the church? Child Guidance 551 paragraph 3 Young men and women who are not under home influences need someone to look after them and to manifest some interest for them. And those who do this are supplying a great lack and are as verily doing a work for God and the salvation of souls as the minister in the pulpit. So it is really clear the admonition of the spirit of prophecy that there will be godly parents that will adapt these young people who are alone their siblings their parents are not members of the church and they can adapt them they can support them spiritually and someday these young people will grow mature in faith and they will be 
they'll become pillars of the church in the future. You remember Paul? He took care of Timothy. And this young boy became mature through the tutelage of Paul. And finally, Timothy became minister of the gospel. In order to conclude our study today, we can make some conclusion that when all the pastors, Bible workers, church leaders, and members are all united in loving and in caring for one another, then the people of God will draw together and present to the enemy a united front. And then the words of Apostle John will be fulfilled. It says here in 1 John 4, 10 and 11, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. It is really amazing that if we love God, we need also to love one another. So, if we as a church will do this, what will happen? Testimonies, volume 6, page 40. The love of Christ, the love of our brethren, will testify to the world that we have been with Jesus and learned of Him. Then will the message of the third angel will swell to a loud cry, and the whole earth will be lightened with the glory of the Lord. Here we can see that the swelling of the loud cry will come only when we reach to the point that everyone will love one another. Every one of us will care for one another. And then the light of the third angel's message will swell to a loud cry. And what will happen when the people of the world will see this light of unity, will see the light of love among us? When the people of the world will see that we are united in the love of Christ, and as this light will shine, and all who are honest, will leave the fallen churches and take their stand with the remnant. Here we can see that the final gathering of the 144,000 that will be caused by the swelling of the loud cry of the third angel will only happen when our people will be united in the love of Christ. When the people of God will reflect the character of Jesus fully, then Jesus will be happy perfectly. And guess what will happen? Then he will come and claim them as his own. May the Lord God will bless us and will help us to love one another and to care one another. This is my wish and prayer. Amen. Thank you.